Hello and just tell everyone welcome to class 12 biology. In this uh, video we are going to discuss about the chromosomal theory of inheritance. Uh, this theory of inheritance was proposed by Sutton and Bovary in year 1902. Uh, you might want to copy down these two names and keep them in your memory. Sutton and Bovary were the two people who uh, proposed the chromosomal theory of inheritance. So what is chromosomal theory of inheritance? We will try to understand in this particular video. But before that, let's take a look at this particular timeline uh, I have provided over here. In year 1865, in year 1865, uh, Mendel published his work. In, it was in year 1865 when Mendel published his work regarding his hybridization experiments with pea plants. He already wrote about law of dominance, law of segregation, and law of independent assortment and everything. However, due to some reasons uh, we will discuss later on, uh, his work went unrecognized. He, he didn't become famous. He didn't become famous uh, when he was alive. Uh, and he died in 1884. So since he published his work in 1865, uh, for 35 years his work went unrecognized. Uh, but in year 1900, uh, Gregor's, Gregor Mendel's work was rediscovered. His work was rediscovered by these three people over here. Uh, these names are also important. You have to note them down. Uh, Karl Korens, Hugo de Vries, and von Schmack. So these were the three people who rediscovered Mendel's work in the year 1900. So uh, the sad part about Gregor Mendel was his scientific work uh, that he did with his uh, pea plants hybridization experiments uh, it was not recognized uh, he didn't uh, his work didn't get recognized by the scientists who, who were present during his time uh, it was much later in year 1900 that his work got recognized uh, and it was rediscovered by these three people so let us discuss about what were the reasons why gregor mendel's work went unrecognized so these are the few reasons which are given in your textbook and I will tell you one more reason uh, apart from these four. Uh, so the first reason is uh, the communication was not easy during Mendel's time. So during Mendel's time even though he published his work he, uh, he was not able to communicate his results. He was not able to communicate with other scientists uh, that easily. So communication was not easy during Mendel's time. Uh, the second reason was his concept of genes or factors that didn't blend wasn't accepted by his contemporaries. So what it means is uh, the, the scientists or the biologists of Mendel's time, they believed that uh, in a hybridization, the uh, characters, they tend to blend. And that is the reason why we see so many variations in, in our surroundings. So scientists, they believed about the blending of the characters. However, uh, Mendel proposed that the, uh, the characters are passed down from parents to offspring uh, through stable uh, factors, something called factors, which was stable and it remained unchanged. So this was not accepted by his contemporaries. So the third reason was, uh, the third reason why Mendel's when work went unrecognized was uh, his use of mathematics in biology. He used mathematics in biology and that was new during his time and it was unacceptable. So scientists or the biologists of Mendel's time, they did not accept the use of mathematics in biology. So Gregor Johann Mendel was primarily a mathematician. He loved mathematics. Uh, therefore, he used lots of statistics in his uh, hybridization experiment results. Uh, we remember those ratios, 3 is to 1, 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1 ratios and everything. So uh, he used mathematics to support his uh, findings. So that was unacceptable. That was unacceptable for many of the biologists during Mendel's time. Uh, that is one reason. Uh, so the last and the final reason over here, which is provided in your textbook is, uh, which is pretty important, uh, Mendel was not able to provide any physical proof of his so-called factors. So during Mendel's time, uh, Mendel just said that uh, 
something was being passed down from parents to offsprings through gametes. And that's something he just called it as factors. And when people ask, what is factors? Can you show us the proof of uh, this factor? Uh, Mendel was not having any answer for that. He, he was not able to provide any answer for that. So he was not able to provide any physical proof of his so-called factor. So that is why his work uh, went unrecognized. And, the, and one extra uh, reason why Mendel remained unpopular, was he, he, why he didn't gain popularity was uh, during Mendel's time, uh, Charles Darwin was gaining popularity. So everyone was uh, mesmerized by Charles Darwin's work and his theories of evolution and everything. So Mendel and his research on pea plants, it went unrecognized when he was alive. But in year 1900, but in year 1900, these three people over here, Karl Korens, Hugo de Vries, and von Schmack. So these three botanists, so these were the scientists who were working with plants, they were all doing hybridization experiments. They realized that whatever they were finding during that time, uh, it was already been done by a monk uh, or Gregor Mendel back in year 1865, and it was already published. So uh, these three scientists, they are given the credit of rediscovering Gregor Mendel's uh, work with pea plants. And uh, they independently rediscovered Mendel's work in the year 1900. Independently means they didn't have much uh, contact with each other. They were conducting their own research with their own plants. But whatever they were finding, the results they found out, uh, Everything was already done by Gregor Mendel uh, back in 1865 with his pea plants. So they were uh, surprised and uh, they thought that his work should be publicized among the scientists of their time. So they, uh, they helped expand awareness about Mendel's laws of inheritance to the scientific world. So in year 1900, these three scientists, they rediscovered Mendel's work. So by year 1902, by, by year 1902, lots of advancements in microscopy were made. Microscopes were improving. Microscopes, the power of microscopes, the magnification, resolution, and everything were uh, improving a lot. The technology of microscopy was improving a lot. And uh, based upon that, many of the cell biologists, they were able to observe cell divisions. Right. So they were able to carefully observe the cell divisions and this observation of cell divisions by the cell biologists led to the discovery of a physical structure which is located within the chromosome, which is located within the nucleus and they call them as chromosomes. And these structures, uh, they, they duplicated or they replicated just before cell division and then they get distributed uh, among the daughter cells. So that they called them as chromosomes uh, because these were the physical structures which uh, gets darkly stained when they were trying to observe them under a microscope. Um, so, so the discovery of chromosomes were made during that time. And while they discovered chromosomes, uh, they also observed the movement of chromosomes during the cell division. So I already told you that the chromosomes, they multiply just before cell division and then they get distributed among, uh, between the daughter cells. So the chromosomal movement was observed during cell division, especially during uh, cell meiosis, which is the cell division involved in the formation of gametes. So chromosomal movements were observed by the scientists and all these observations were, were made possible because of the advancements in micro microscopy. So the technology plays an important part in discoveries of discoveries in the other fields as well, science as well. So after these discoveries were made, uh, two important scientists, I told you, right, their name, Sutton and Bovary, Walter Sutton and Theodore Bovary, they observed that the behavior of the chromosomes, the behavior of the chromosomes is similar to the behavior of genes as proposed by Gregor Mendel. So these two, right, other, other, other biologists, they were just trying to observe what, what is happening with the chromosomes and 
how they behaved. But uh, these were the two scientists, Walter Sutton and Theodore Bowery, who, who came up with the idea and uh, they said that the behavior of the chromosomes is uh, surprisingly very similar to the behavior of the so-called genes or factors which were proposed by Gregor Mendel back in 1865. So what were the similarities between behavior of chromosomes and genes? So what, what similarities did uh, Sutton and Bovary observed between the behavior of chromosomes and genes were? Uh, so these were the three, re and these were the three similarities. Uh, Sutton and Bovary observed that both chromosomes as well as genes, they occur in pairs, right? They occur in pairs. So both the chromosomes and genes, they occur in pairs. Uh, I have given a picture over here, uh, alleles. So these are the two factors that Mendel talked about. He said there is a pair of factors which, is, which controls the uh, character, right? So these alleles or the pair of factors, right, they occur in pairs. As well as what Sutton and Bowery saw was the chromosomes, they also occur in pairs. So we call them as homologous chromosomes. One which comes from the father, let's say the blue one comes from the father and the red one comes from the mother. So these are the homologous chromosomes. Uh, which we inherit from our parents. So they occur in pairs, uh, just like Mendel's alleles. They also occur in pairs, one from the father, one from the father and one from the mother. So that is one similarity. So the second similarity was both segregate during gamete formation. The chromosomes as well as the alleles, they both segregate or separate during gamete formation. So over here you can see, I've given a picture over here, uh, during gamete formation, during meiosis, what happens is these two homologous chromosomes, the blue one and the red one, one from the father and one from the mother, what happens is during gamete formation, uh, these two homologous chromosomes, they segregate such that uh, each gamete will get only one, right, over here. So two gametes are formed and each gamete, they are getting one of the pair, right. Uh, just like what Gregor Mendel proposed. And uh, when he said uh, that during gamete formation, the so-called factors which occurs in pair, they segregate somehow, right? So the segregation was the similarity between the chromosomes and the genes. And finally, the, seg uh, the third similarity was the segregation of this particular segregation. Segregation of one pair is independent of other pairs. And let's say there are more than these two chromosomes, right? These two chromosomes. Let's say there are many other pairs. So the segregation of one pair is independent. It's not dependent upon the other pairs, right? I will show you the picture over here. Let's say these are the two pairs. We have two pairs over here, right? now. One pair over here and another pair over here. So what they observed was that the segregation, right, how they segregated uh, during gamete formation was independent of each other. How these two T segregated uh, were independent of how these two R segregated. So we will see uh, after these two chromosomes were pulled towards that pole and uh, these, two pole, these two chromosomes are pulled towards that pole, we get two gametes over here, right? In one gamete, we get two red chromosomes and in one gamete we get two blue chromosomes. But this is not the only alignment possible during the cell division process. During meiosis anaphase 1 or metaphase 1, what we observe is the, uh, the arrangement of the homologous chromosomes is very, very random. How the chromosomes uh, align themselves is very random. And uh, there is uh, that since it is random, there is a possibility that uh, the alignment can change like this one in some other cell. So when the alignment is changed like this, so these two chromosomes get pulled towards that pole and these two chromosomes, they get pulled towards that pole. So what happens is two daughter cells are formed in which uh, a, a one daughter cell is getting a red chromosome and a blue chromosome over here and the other daughter cell is getting a blue chromosome and a red chromosome over here. So this is what uh, what has been proposed by Gregor Mendel back in 1865 when he didn't know much about chromosomes, right? He said that the, in, inside the gametes, the segregation of one pair of alleles is independent of the segregation of the other pair of alleles. So he, al he has already told about that in his law of independent assortment. And 
uh, Sutton and Bovary, they also saw that the segregation of one pair of chromosome is independent from the segregation of other pair of chromosome. So based upon these observations, right, these similarities between the behavior of chromosomes and behavior of uh, alleles or the genes, uh, Sutton and Bovary, they proposed their chromosomal theory of inheritance. So what does chromosomal theory of inheritance state? It states that the individual genes or the alleles, they are found at specific locations on particular chromosomes. So this is very important. What Sutton and Bovary said was the so-called factors or the so-called genes, they are located on chromosomes, on particular locations. And the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis can explain how the chromosomes behave during the uh, cell division process or the meiosis during meiosis can explain why genes are inherited according to Mendelian laws, right? So how the genes are inherited through Mendelian laws can be explained by how chromosomes behave during the cell division process, especially during meiosis. So that is the chromosomal theory of inheritance. I hope you understood what chromosomal theory of inheritance means. So that is one. However, uh, even though Walter and Sutton, uh, Sutton and Bovary, Sutton and Bovary, they uh, proposed, they proposed their theory of inheritance, uh, chromosomal theory of inheritance. Many of the scientists they were really skeptic about uh, the validity of that their theory. Uh, many of the scientists they did not accept the chromosomal theory of inheritance just like that, even though they could observe the similarity between the chromosomes and uh, behavior of chromosomes and the behavior of genes but they were not ready to accept easily. So one, one of the skeptics was Thomas Hunt Morgan. Thomas Hunt Morgan was one of the skeptics who did not believe in the chromosomal theory of inheritance, but he was carrying out uh, hybridization experiments with a particular organism. And this time it was not a plant, it was an animal, an insect called Drosophila melanogaster. So Thomas Hunt Morgan, right, he did not believe in chromosomal theory of inheritance, but he was carrying out his hybridization experiments uh, with this uh, particular animal called Drosophila melanogaster or flu fruit flies. He was trying to observe the inheritance of uh, eye color in uh, this particular insect, how the eye colors are inherited. And he realized that when he was conducting his experiments with the Drosophila, he realized that what Sutton and Bovary has proposed is actually true. Right? He found out that the gene which controls the eye color of the uh, insect or the fruit flies, that particular gene is located on X chromosome. So how these two individuals, right? how the insects, they inherit X chromosome, uh, was exactly the same as how they inherited the eye color. So it, over here you can see the difference, right? We have this wild type in which the normal eye color is uh, red. Uh, so if the gene is somehow mutated or modified, it becomes white, right? So he was trying to observe the inheritance of red eye color and white eye color in the Drosophila melanogaster. And why he was trying to figure out the inheritance pattern, he found out that the gene which, which is controlling the eye color is located on X chromosome. So he uh, somehow he provided uh, proof that the theory of uh, uh, chromosomal theory of inheritance was true. So he, his experiment became the verification of the chromosomal theory of inheritance. So why Thomas Hunt Morgan chose Drosophila melanogaster as his model organism? Uh, you may come across questions like why pea plant is a good model organism for the study of genetics. So you may have to come, out, come up with answers for that question as well. Uh, you can find out all over internet why pea plant, uh, why pea plant is a good model organism for the study of genetics. So I will just answer why Drosophila is a good uh, model organism to study genetics. 
uh, why Thomas Hunt Morgan chose Drosophila melanogaster. So there are certain reasons. So the first reason is these insects, they can be easily grown in simple synthetic medium in labs. They are very easy to grow in the labs. We don't need much resource. What we need is we need these glass tubes inside just fill them with fruit sludge and just let two, uh, one male and one female Drosophila inside. They will mate and they will produce eggs and after a few days you will get lots and lots of eggs and lots and lots of Drosophila genies. So it is very easy. Inside the lab you can easily maintain uh, lots and lots of uh, Drosophila melanogaster. Uh, second advantage of uh, Drosophila, mel Drosophila melanogaster in the study of genetics is they have very short life cycles. Having short life cycles is a very important uh, character for the model organism because while we are studying the inheritance pattern, if the life cycle is really long, let's say like an elephant or an oak tree, uh, what happens is uh, we don't have much time right, uh, to study. So we will get less sample size. So uh, our findings, it will take long time, it will be very cumbersome and we won't get enough data for that. So having short life cycles is also very important. Uh, character of a good model organism in the study of genetics. So Drosophila has got very short life cycle so that is why Thomas Hunt Morgan chose Drosophila. Third is uh, there is a clear sexual dimorphism. What does this particular term mean sexual dimorphism? It simply means that we can easily tell uh, male apart from the female. It is very easy for us to tell whether this Drosophila is male or female. So it is very easy to distinguish the male Drosophila from female Drosophila. So by just by looking at the morphology, we can tell. So this is called, uh, this is uh, one uh, uh, good advantageous uh, character of a model organism. It has got clear sexual dimorphism. So the fourth uh, character, uh, why Drosophila is a good model organism is they, these Drosophila they have got many observable heredity variations just like I said before like eye color right so there are many uh, variations regarding the Drosophila eye coloration and wing size wing shape right all these things the number of bristles on the present on their thorax so there are many variations observable, which is which can which can be easily observed under light microscope. So uh, it, it it becomes a very good organism to study the inheritance pattern. So uh, it becomes a good model organism. So that's all about uh, the chromosomal theory of inheritance. In the next video, we will talk. We will continue talking about experiments conducted by Thomas Hunt Morgan with his. Uh, model organism that is Drosophila melanogaster. In our next video, we will discuss about linkage and recombination. So linkage and recombination, both of these uh, phenomenon were observed by Thomas Hunt Morgan and his colleagues, that his colleagues mean his students. So linkage and recombination, we will discuss in the next video. I hope you will read about these uh, topics before you watch the next video. Thank you.